question is, as on the order paper, uh, Minister George Freeman. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a great pleasure to serve here today with you and to have my first outing at the Spatch Box as the Return Minister for Science, yeah, yeah, yeah. Research, yeah, yeah, yeah. Innovation and Technology at the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, uh, written proudly on the side of the building to refute this litany of woe and failure that the opposition benches love to reel out. Uh, to paint a picture of a British economy that the businesses around this country would really recognise and understand, and to set out in some detail the plans that we have to support, not just the industries of today, but the industries of tomorrow that this country is leading in creating the framework for globally. And uh, I look forward to a good debate this afternoon, not least about uh, the depression of the motion that the opposition have put forward, which says very little about their own positive plans for developer industrial sector for the 21st century, but simply looks to print a cheap leaflet for distribution through the doorsteps. We can do better than that, I hope, this afternoon in this debate we will. So my, my uh, mission, Madam Deputy Speaker, as Minister for Science, Research, Innovation and Technology, is to make the strategic shift in this country from being a service economy, which the party opposite in their long period in office seemed to delight in. Indeed, I remember the Deputy Prime Minister at the time saying, uh, he was profoundly relaxed about all the deregulation in the city and the move to a service economy and the deindustrialisation. This government is absolutely committed to taking the crash of 2007 8 under the Labour government, the very difficult fiscal situation afterwards, the pandemic, the emergency in the Ukraine, as the wake up call that it is to invest more in our industries of tomorrow and today, to develop our industrial resilience, to support the RD for tomorrow's sectors and to support our leadership in net zero through the industries of today, which I would have liked to have thought the party opposite might have wanted to celebrate. The truth is British industry is leading the way in net zero in this country, and it is something we should be proud of. But I will come to the detail of that in due course. In my, uh, let me just make way in my opening remarks, and I will come to the member opposite in a moment. Uh, in my specific role and portfolio, my job is this. It is to help support the industries of tomorrow. So whether it is life sciences, in which I set out ten years ago with the then minister uh, the first 10-year life science strategy in this country. We, we launched the genomics programme, we launched NHS Digital, Accelerated Access, laid a lot of the foundation for this country's success in the pandemic. We have launched a 10-year space strategy for commercial uh, leadership in the space sector last year, and we are now in the process of implementing it. We have set out a 10-year plan for fusion. We are investing through the Utom uh, UK Atomic Energy Authority in the groundbreaking technology at Cullum. We have announced this summer that we are moving that to Nottinghamshire and creating the world's first industrial deployment of uh, fusion technology at commercial scale over the next 10-15 years. In quantum, we are setting out a quantum strategy on Friday. I was with the quantum industry who are applauding us. We are number one in Europe in the quantum industry and investment, and that is a partnership between big companies, the T Toshiba, BT, BAE and many others, and our very fertile ecosystem of small companies and our universities. And similarly, in agri-tech, I was proud uh, as the then Minister to launch the UK's first industrial strategy for agritech. So forgive me, Madam Deputy Speaker, if I don't take any lectures from the party opposite on the lack of an industrial strategy. Far from it. It was indeed the former <laughs> member for Hartlepool who, when he was Deputy Prime Minister, paid tribute to this party, to myself, the then Chancellor and the men, then Minister uh, David Willits in the other house, as leading the thinking on a modern industrial strategy for a modern economy. And the truth is that in the last few years, that work has been uh, interrupted inevitably by, firstly, the pandemic, and I'm proud that we put in on this side of the House £400 billion of business support for industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Secondly, Ukraine, which has been a wake-up call to the world at the re uh, resilience of our industrial supply chains, and we have worked head and shoulders in the last year to beef up those industrial supply chains to protect British industry from that vulnerability, and we continue to do so. And let me just finish, and then thirdly, on uh, the tightening of the global energy markets, which has hit many energy intensive industries very hard. We have announced £25 billion of support for the next six months. So far from the doom and gloom of this motion, which, if anyone reads it, uh, paints a picture that this government it says it has no strategy for industry, has no policy for industry, it is complete rubbish. I will happily give word. For giving way on, on doom and gloom. But get, well, you, you, the, the mention earlier on of the solid free, fleet support ships that we on this side of the House have argued for many years should be built here for strategic reasons with steel manufactured here. Yeah. But can I ask him about rail, the North East, 
the home of the railways. In my constituency, Viva Rail, world-beating, self-charging, all-electric train manufacturer, starved of government support and investment. It could be a beacon for the future. Why isn't that on your list of shining examples? Uh, well, the Honourable Member, um, the reason it was on the list was I was listing all the industries of tomorrow. I'll come to, uh, I'll come to the specific points he makes. The biggest customer for steel in this country is our rail sector, and we are proud that the UK rail industry, into which we are pouring an unprecedented level of investment, is a major supplier of British steel. And I'll come to the steel industry in a moment. But my point was, the motion paints a picture of doom and gloom, collapse of manufacturing. It's time to put this stale old labour trope to bed. On manufacturing, let me just highlight the UK is still the ninth biggest manufacturing country in the world. Manufacturing this last year contributed £205 billion in gross value add to the UK economy. We're the fourth largest manufacturing economy in Europe. Uh, we support almost 2.5 million jobs, and I would say manufacturing jobs have been hemorrhaging under the last Labour government. We stopped that in 2010, and through major investment of the sort that I've just set out, we've turned around the manufacturing sector in this country. It's now much more advanced. Uh, and I, again, I would be—I'm surprised the party opposite aren't congratulating us on that. It was uh, manufacturing jobs were collapsing in this country. 84% of manufacturing now takes place all around the country, outside of London, not just in the old industrial blue belt, but uh, in the space economy down in uh, Cornwall, in Glasgow. Uh, I thought members opposite would cheer that from the Scottish Ashes. Um, for North Wales, the North Wales Energy Corridor, I'll come to the honourable member opposite, the South Wales Compound Semiconductor Cluster, the Warwick Robotics Cluster. The truth is that our manufacturing economy is highly advanced, highly competitive and decentralised all around the country. I shall come to steel, shipbuilding and automotive in a moment. I was making the point. The reason I hadn't listed his particular rail point was that I was highlighting the industries of tomorrow. I'll happily give way to the honourable member. I thank the Minister for giving way. Does he know how many tonnes of British steel there are in a single wind turbine, onshore or offshore, in our country? How many tonnes of British steel? British... I don't have that number at my fingertips, but I have a funny feeling he does. Uh, and I know that my honourable friend, the Minister for, uh, for Small Business, will respond on that uh, later on. Uh, let me just turn then to the shipbuilding, automotive and uh, steel industries which the motion particularly highlights. I will happily give way. I would like to remind the Minister, he's talked about the, the, the space and uh, science-led businesses that are around the country, but in response to the, the, the member opposite in terms of the North East, we have of course got to not forget what tremendous things are going on in uh, Setchfield at Net Park. Well, there are indeed uh, fantastic things going on at Net Park. It will be, you would think the Labour Party, which uh, dominated County Durham politics for decades, which seemed to indulge in the poverty up there, would be celebrating the phenomenal turnaround in the North East, one of our leading manufacturing regions now. Net Park, home to Cromec, Newcastle, home to Quantum DX. This is a great story of British manufacturing driving an advanced economy in the areas that were blighted by painful deindustrialisation. And I'm very proud that this party is in the vanguard of it. Yes, I'll happily give way. For giving way. And we do have things to celebrate in the North East with, uh, with new manufacturing, there's no doubt about that. But Teesside Steel Industry is now a shadow of its former self. It's got a few hundred jobs now instead of the many, many thousands there were a few years ago before the government abandoned us. Does the Minister agree we should invest in Teesside Steel now and then use its product for the new industry jobs that were promised? Uh, well, that's, I thank, I thank the honourable member for that. That brings me to steel, and he makes an important point. We have seen uh, real pressure in the steel industry in the last uh, uh, decade, if uh, and more, the last 15, 20 years. The truth is, uh, global economic conditions are hugely challenging for all domestic steel sectors. We've seen massive overcapacity, unfair overseas subsidies. We've seen steel dumping. And the real, the real issue is that global steel production has more than doubled since 1995, and China has been by far the biggest contributor to this growth. In 1995, Manager Speaker, China accounted for 13 per cent of the world's steel production. By 2019, that had risen to 53 per cent. So we've seen a phenomenal change in the global steel market. And this, yes, I'll happily give way. I thank, oh, is he giving way to you? I don't know. Oh, I thank the yes. Minister for, for giving way. Um, 
I've been in this place um, 10 years today, and I've been working with my local steel company since I first got elected in Cardiff, South and Penarth, and they have consistently raised the same issues with me. Competitive electricity prices for the green steel they produce, and ensuring that procurement in this country, particularly in the industries, the future of those green industries, is using UK steel. What exactly has this government done to ensure that there are competitive prices and that UK steel is used in those green industries? Because, quite frankly, they haven't done enough. Uh, Well, he he does make an important point about the challenge, and we've done a lot. Let me... uh, um, uh, share with him what we've done. So our ongoing, yes, I'll deal with that specific point. Our ongoing support for steel includes this, this year more than 800 million in, in relief for uh, electricity costs in the steel industry, in addition to the electricity bills relief scheme. Uh, the sector can apply for help with all sorts of energy efficiency for decarbonisation, low carbon infrastructure, uh, and there's over a billion available in competitive funding for the industry in that sector alone. I, let me just deal with this point. We're investing over 600 billion to transform our country's infrastructure, that's roads, rail, broadband and more, and we plan to procure 8.5 million tonnes of steel as part of that over the next decade. So you touched on procurement, and we published an updated steel uh, pipeline in June 2020 to help the industry plan ahead. The value of UK steel procured by the Government, which I checked before coming to this debate today, in 2021 for major public projects was anyone opposite? No. 268 million, an increase of 160 million from the previous year. The Steel Procurement Task Force, which we have set up, is a joint working group between government and the steel industry, published seven recommendations in February of this year, and those are being implemented through updating the Cabinet Office Procurement Policy Note. So, as the Honourable Member will see, it was a good question. We are taking serious steps on procurement. In 2021, the Secretary of State for Defence acquired specialist steel producer Sheffield Forge Masters with a £400 million investment for the next 10 years. And Forge Masters are working with other companies, including Rolls Royce and the Canadian company General Fusion, on the development of nuclear power generation. In March of this year, we successfully s- secured an expansive removal uh, of the US Section 232 tariffs on UK steel and aluminium products. Uh, that means UK steel and aluminium exports to the US can return to levels not seen since before 2018. And we've extended our steel safeguards measures for a further two years. So I simply don't accept. That it's, uh, I don't think anyone listening to this debate would say that the government's done nothing, is not doing anything on procurement. It's simply not true. I'm, I'm to the Minister for, for giving away. I've heard what he's had to say. But what does he say to uh, the people of Teesside about his government's inaction mm-hmm. in 2015? Mm-hmm. We, the, the Italian government intervened at the Ilva plant at Taranto yep. and came to the rescue of 25,000 workers. The French did the same in, yep. in Florange. Uh, but that government, sitting on those benches, did absolutely nothing to protect our core industries at Redcar, and they haven't forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. Industrial yeah. damage. Well, he, he mentions this. Uh, I would just point out that last week Green Lithium announced the UK's first large scale merchant lithium uh, refinery, and the first in Europe will be built where? Teesport, supported by the Automotive Transformation Fund. I happily give way to the member. Madam Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister um, the same question which I asked the Shadow Minister about a potential solution to the problems of high electricity costs faced by energy intensive industries such as steel, which we have just been hearing about from the opposition benches, about whether or not a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which the Government has already um, consulted on and has already committed to in principle, whether or not that would help to level the playing field between British energy costs and those abroad and therefore make British heavy industry, particularly energy intensive industry, far more competitive on the international scale. Well, my honourable friend, as ever, makes a very interesting uh, policy observation and policy point, which, as Minister for Science, I won't uh, accept here at the box in the House, but I will raise with the Minister of State for Industry and for Energy, uh, as I'll happily give way to the honourable member. Thank for giving way. You mentioned nuclear power. Now, we heard what I said about costs earlier on, but it's also reported the government's staying at a 20% share in size we'll see. So does that mean the government's going to borrow... Um, five or six billion pounds to pay their 20 per cent share towards cap- uh, size we'll see. Here, here. Well, how interesting to hear the SNP take issue uh, with, with the. Well, I mean, you asked the question, so I'll answer it. With the, uh, sorry, you didn't answer the question, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Honourable Member uh, from the SNP asked the question. Um, we are determined to make sure that we, unlike parties opposite, invest properly in new nuclear in this country, to make sure we have a resilient, clean and secure energy system. And if that means an active industrial strategy to make sure that we're able to do it, we are doing it. It would be nice to hear the SNP government in Scotland take a similar approach to its future and to nuclear in this country, which is vital uh, for the next few years as we get through this global tightening in global energy. Now, I shall make some progress, if I may, on the point of... Uh, 
the automotive sector, which was also mentioned in the motion. The UK's auto sector is hugely competitive globally, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's export focused and has a very strong R&D base. The truth is, in the last 20, 30 years, it's transformed from uh, what it was in the 1970s to now what it is, a highly competitive uh, and highly technological and advanced R&D based sector. It's also in the vanguard of the transition to net zero, and the UK, because of the government's efforts, is very well placed to seize those opportunities. Why? Well, because we're pursuing an active industrial strategy for net zero in industry. That's 58. The industry has a uh, the automotive-related manufacturing sector is worth 58 billion pounds to the economy, uh, and typically invests around three billion each year in R&D. Three billion in R&D from the sector alone. 155,000 people employed in automotive manufacturing in the UK uh, in 21. That's six percent of total UK manufacturing. This isn't uh, the honourable members opposite may laugh at the success of the British automotive sector, but this is a tribute to the business and industry adaptability and the government's partnership in setting out a framework for the net zero transition. The truth is, decarbonising transport is already starting to create thousands of jobs in green industries, and the production of net zero road transport vehicles is on track to to support the development of 72,000 jobs worth up to £9 billion to the economy. This government has proven loud and clear that you can deliver green transition and growth, something all parties opposite have bitterly insisted was not possible. I am very grateful to the Minister um, for giving way. He talks about decarbonisation of transport. Of the 4,000 buses that the, uh, the previous, previous Prime Minister um, <laughs> um, promised nearly three years ago, how many of them are currently on the road in England? Yeah, yeah, good question. I will have to check the exact number, but what I can tell him is that I am surprised he did not mention Aberdeen's leadership with our support, Aberdeen as a hydrogen hub. And the creation of the hydrogen hubs in Teesside, down in Harwich, all around this country, we're investing in another industry of tomorrow, green and blue hydrogen. And it's very, his question is revealing because it suggests in a motion the government's doing nothing at all about hydrogen. Far from it. We're investing in the infrastructure for the hydrogen of tomorrow. Let me just finish the point, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, on the automotive sector. I'll happily give way to my honourable and very grateful to the minister. Is there a danger that, that the UK could end uh, diesel and petrol vehicle production too early yeah. compared with competitors yeah. before we've got uh, an up and running, really large electric car industry? And wouldn't that be bad news for our industry? Yes. Well, my honourable friend uh, does make an important point about making sure that, yes, as we lead in the delivery of the net zero automotive sector, we get the balance right that we're not. Uh, 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 unrealistically expecting consumers to make the transition too fast or indeed undermining our leadership in that sector. That is a fine balance. It is one this Government is committed to making. We are determined to lead the way in demonstrating green growth in pursuit of net zero, but we do want to make sure that we capture the industrial leadership in that sector. Uh, in automotive, Madam Deputy Speaker, we made, again, significant investments, more than £1.2 billion to support innovative projects through the Advanced Propulsion Centre. Uh, that uh, and it's, the projects that it has funded have helped create over 50,000 jobs and saved 277 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. Last month, we announced a record 200 million for the Faraday Battery Challenge. Uh, we have worked closely with Nissan, who have just announced a 1 billion investment to create a North of England electric vehicle hub in Sunderland, safeguarding 6,500 jobs. In Ford in Halewood, 227 million. Stellantis, over 100 million in uh, the Vauxhall plant at Ellesmere Port. Bentley, 2.5 billion. These are major investments from an industry that is growing in this country with government support. It would have been nice to hear the opposition at least pay tribute to some of this success. And in the EV supply chain, we are actively investing in pursuit of our industrial strategy for green growth. Uh, the ATF has supported uh, that billion pound electric vehicle hub. We also supported Pensana's one and a half, uh, 145 million investment in East Yorkshire. And through the ATF, we've recently supported a 60 million investment to develop hydrogen technologies with Johnson Matthey. Far, Madam Deputy Speaker, from this government abandoning our commitment to industry, we are doubling down our commitment to help the existing industries of today make this transition and to support the industries of tomorrow. I want to turn finally to shipbuilding, which was mentioned. Uh, the shipbuilding industry in this country, which opposition members would suggest has been decimated, and, uh, it actually employs 42,500 people in this country. It's worth 2.8 billion. It's a major sector. Naval orders through the government remain an important driver of the prosperity of it. In 2020, the MOD spent 3.8 billion on shipbuilding and repair, directly supporting 22,000 jobs around the economy. Over the last decade, we have seen once great names in shipbuilding like Holland and Wolf struggle, uh, putting at risk 
uh, that particular heritage. But Holland and Wolf, under the ownership of Infrastrata, are strong again, and this resurgence is part of a general trend in global consolidation in the industry. We have seen how the symbiosis between MOD, naval and commercial buildings brings improved competitiveness as businesses like Camel Laird deliver large commercial vessels alongside the Royal Fleet Auxiliary commitments. And I am very proud, as the Minister for Science, that the uh, Royal Research Ship Sir David Attenborough is one of those ships that has been built of British steel. The commissioning and delivery of the new aircraft carriers has been a massive shot in the arm, uh, and at the same time we have seen big advances in uh, key technologies like aluminium hull design and the application of robots for automated welding. The truth is that programme is also driving technological leadership. And in 2019, shipboat repair maintenance was worth £2.6 billion to the economy. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I do not think it is at all fair to suggest, as the motion does, that this government has neither an interest in industry, a policy for industry, that we are abandoning industry. Far from it. Not only are we helping our key industries deal with massive global challenges in the form of the pandemic, the energy crisis, we are actively pursuing an active industrial strategy for the industries of tomorrow, and that is actively supporting clusters all around the country to drive uh, levelling up and opportunity. And it would be nice to hear the parties opposite at least pay some tribute to the success of that private-public partnership and the success and resilience of British industry. Uh, before I call the SNP uh, spokesperson, colleagues will see that this is a very well-subscribed debate, so I will have to put a time limit on. I will start with six minutes, but I warn it might go down quite quickly. Uh, SNP spokesperson Alan Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam.